Hello, my name is Jordan Squires. Thank you for coming today. Uh, I think this is the first student-led lecture, and as far as anyone knows who is here, so we'll call it the first student-run lecture. And um, today I'll be introducing Greg Colby. Um, Greg is the Cultural Studies Assistant Teacher for Dora's 4A class. Um, this lecture tonight is also meant to coincide with the modernist master's lectures and some some evil UGA classes. And then um, so uh, tonight uh, Greg will be sort of offering a, a roadmap of what to do with your summer if you uh, don't get the internship that you want or you don't wish to prostitute yourself to a professor. <laughs> um, in law twenty four. Anthony Mithar writes the essay up against the wall called Roma Claudrette. And so that's a critic writing about a story visiting a like a Lucia project. And I remember after the essay came out, I said to Greg, uh, heaven forbid that anyone actually go see these problems. And um, I think for me, the important thing about this lecture tonight is that we have so many great sources of knowledge in the school and then, um, but we often skip over the fact that a lot of the knowledge we get comes from our classmates and ultimately our own observations. So when I was working in New York this summer, uh, I was excited to know that there was the form show at home. And then, um, so I went to see it and it was like supposed to be my sort of one little bit of Greg's huge experience that he was going to have. and. Uh, and the models and the drawings were all really great, uh, but some of them were sort of these like horrible like wooden models that like clearly weren't by Forb, and it was just these like awkward wooden models of concrete buildings that were built in the seventies by like these like Ivy League guys. It wasn't really anything to do with Forb. And then also on the sixth floor of, of MoMA was the uh, Klaus Oldenburg show. And, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, my experience this summer next to Greg felt like an awkward rubber cheeseburger in the next room. So, with that, I welcome Greg Salty. Okay, so this lecture is coming from a few different places. Um, as I'll explain in a bit, I traveled in France this summer with the intention of studying, that's the volume by the way, yeah. Um, with the intention of studying the four major core projects. And I started taking really, uh, some really great photos and detailing the projects in a very detailed way with the intention of doing a presentation for both 10 of my close friends here to recreate the experience of going rather than just looking at photographs from a textbook, which I felt um, really pale compared to my experience. And, and the second place this is coming from was when I was in 1GA, um, I noticed a real lack of precedent study that happens in this school, and that was very frustrating to me. And so I ended up teaching myself about these buildings on my own time. And the knowledge that I gained from that was invaluable all the projects I went on to do here. Um, and so, in some way, I'm just designing this lecture for the 1GA and the 2GA, the 1A and the 2A, to give you the knowledge that I had to uh, give myself, and hopefully I can pass that on, uh, with the idea that if I can strengthen your degree tonight just a little bit, then all of our degrees are worth because we're at a pinnacle of this school, I feel, and I feel like we should make the most of it. And there's lots of people in this room who could be doing a lecture like this and giving uh, knowledge to all of us. And so, I mean, I, people I'm talking to you. Um, and the third place is a paper I've given to the four A's twice this term, which is the Mids on Domino article by Peter Eisenman. And it was, originally given to us by Todd Gannon in first year, and it's a way of studying that was really instilled into us by Jonah Rowan as well, who's one of our professors. And it's a way of looking at a masterwork with the idea that absolutely no detail should go unscrutinized, and that everything 
in the project is there for a reason. So I've assessed these four projects tonight under that lens and um, under that method. So, um, I was having this experience last spring where I was starting to get to a bit of a breaking point in, uh, for myself personally, and um, I felt like my soul was rotting because I hadn't been traveling in so long. Um, so, I was trying to figure out how to get to France, and I actually had this really interesting experience with Fresia and Kirsten, who are here tonight, and um, I made them promise or sorry, I made them promise that if I didn't go to Europe this past summer, that I would come back and they would give me a serious heck. Um, because I was very serious about going. But I, I immediately started to get quite worried about that promise because I had no idea how it's going to pay for it because I'm Canadian and so I don't get any money to be here and my life is hanging by thread and band-aids. Um, and I was talking to Fresia and Kirsten then later that night, I walked home around midnight, and I was kind of bummed because I was trying to figure out how I was going to pull this off because I had no idea. And I got home and I opened the door to my apartment, and there was this envelope sitting there. And I was like, okay, what's this? You know, probably a letter from my mom. And it was a wedding invitation from one of my close friends from undergrad, inviting me to France for August 3rd for her wedding. And considering at that moment, you know, four seconds before, I was figuring out, trying to figure out how I could get to Europe, I took that as a sign that, you know what, this is something I really need to do. So, despite having absolutely no money, a week later at home, I bought a plane ticket with no money in my bank account and had to figure out how to pay for it. So, I went, I had an internship during the week and worked as a janitor on Saturday and Sunday for two months um, and ran myself into the ground until July, at which point I could so that's why I'm hitchhiking, um, because I really had no other option. Okay, so one thing Jordan wanted me to uh, point out was that um, as a Canadian, we have a really great relationship to French people, so um, that was very advantageous to me. Uh, so that's something he wanted to me to know. So I basically had my bag of clothes and a sleeping bag and a tent with me and like a night. And I would carry a, uh, uh, a baguette whenever I could find it and a wheel of cheese. And that's basically all I had. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. So, this is a map of what I ended up doing, just to give you a rundown before I do it. I started in Barcelona, saw Mies, um, went to Paris, and then saw all these buildings in, su in succession. Went to my friend's wedding and one of them in Marseille. Pretty much every blue line on that page was uh, my hitchhiking route. So here's Barcelona Pavilion and this lovely girl playing in the water. Okay. All right. There's the hero shot. And here it is in AXO, so you can perhaps familiarize yourself with the Okay, so this is the basic diagram of the building. It's a white horizontal slab floating amongst nature. That's the view of the site. And here's a shot from the street. And you can see the garden shed. Hit the slide. And there's the garden shed. So this was conceived as essentially a prototype of the entire building, being like a minimum one family home. These photos are hard to find, so enjoy them. Um, here's a plan of elevation. Okay, so this is the approach route for the building. And uh, as probably lots of you know, the, it is conceived that you essentially drive your vehicle underneath the building so the vehicle becomes part of the experience. And Korg, although he says and envisions the project as being a four sided. Um, facade where each facade is of equivalence to one another, um, I disagree strongly, and I'm about to show you why. So here's a view of the approach uh, coming towards the building. Here's the first view you have of it, seeing it through the trees. Okay. 
and here's the first facade you see. And I've read a lot about this building over the last several years, and um, I've come to the conclusion that I think this is the most interesting about, thing about this project. And the reason is, if you recall the diagram I just showed you, the slab floating amongst nature, um, this facade does not accomplish that diagram in any way. And so we all know the importance of this building. It's essentially a holy chapel to modernism. It's built uh, with reference to the Parthenon. And uh, throughout the building, there's all kinds of metaphors to religious um, endeavors. And so, the fact that it doesn't achieve the diagram on the facade that you look at uh, for the longest period of time, can you get the slide with the approach? I think it's the next one. So you can see how long you spend going in that straight line on that front facade. And I think it's absolutely staggering that a project of this magnitude and importance, you spend that much focus and energy looking at the facade that in no way achieves the diagram because it's lying flat on the ground. And if you look at the time you spend with the other facade, it's zero because you go underneath the building in order to enter. So in order to see the other facades, this one here is the second one, that one's the main uh, facade you see in photographs, and this one's the fourth. You don't even get to see the fourth, and you don't see number two and three, unless you go out of your way to walk and look at it. I find that absolutely staggering and shocking, um, and incredibly fascinating, because it's ridiculous in a way that he would allow. Um, I, like, I have no idea what he's trying to say. So here's the photograph we all know. And what's so interesting is, you can see this is symmetrical, just like the first one I showed you. And he, um, on entry, makes it so it goes from symmetrical facade to asymmetrical, then back to symmetrical, almost like some sort of um, disjointed, um, you know, he gives you the symmetry, takes it away, and then gives you the grand release when you come back to the main facade. This one's really interesting to me too. Um, this is an older photograph of the building that um, it's slightly changed. You can see the chimney um, coming up from the stove on the interior and then piercing through the building, it's painted black. And that's really interesting to me because in the existing building it's white like everything else. And the fireplace is some of you know, was a very um, metaphorical navigational device used in historic architecture. And so this seems like some kind of a play on that, given that it is uh, a very modernist, mechanical, um, little piddly object within the building. But he's allowing that functionalist object to pierce through the building and become part of the main facade on the structure. I think that's pretty, pretty incredible. And then this is the fourth facade, which is every bit as conceptually interesting as the first one, but you don't even see that on entry. And so, um, what makes this facade so incredible is, of course, the play on inside-outside, because there's no distinction made due to the transparent glass between there and the fact that both sides of this facade can be read as inside and outside. I think this is um, extremely interesting as well. Because in terms of the Eisenman criteria I laid out, I think this is a great example of it. So you'll notice this column right here is rectilinear. And there's also its uh, sister column, not a photograph. And I think it's really interesting because every other column in the system of the building is circular. And so, if we're to consider architecture the act of intention, which is Peter Eisenman's definition in the one I use, then Corbusier made this column rectilinear for some reason, and it's an act of intention. And why that's interesting to me is not just the rereading of this situation, because if I was to speculate, I would say that this creates some sort of planar implication in line with the spiral staircase, you know, encouraging you to stop and reconsider and go up the ramp, which is the main idea of this building. Um, 
So that's interesting, but also it forces you to reconsider the use of the round columns in the rest of the building as well. So not only does it force you to read this column, but reread every other column in the building. Which, if I was to speculate again, I would say perhaps the circular columns um, imply some sort of movement, and this column implies some sort of stasis. And also interesting about this is, and I'll show you another slide coming up where it's a similar situation. This ramp is on the exact same plane as the spiral staircase. And so you come in, and it's almost like a challenge about which one to choose. And what's interesting is the glass membrane on this side is far more prominent lightening or bringing light in to the spiral staircase. But then you've got the prominent, prominence given to the ramp. So it's like this very interesting tension about choice which I'll show you in another instance of this very soon. Okay, just to talk about this a bit more. So, I wanted to bring up the fact that the school we go to cares about the drawing on the left, and the school, um, and the drawing on the right is an example of other schools. Because this drawing on the left has the rectilinear column, and this drawing on the right, which is just something that came up for me on Google Images, you'll see draws the same column circular. And so, at least for myself and my year and our